Hello again. Welcome back. Today, we're talking about light and how it impacts figures and how you can learn the skill yourself. Many among us begin the painting journey with the Games Workshop Heavy Metal Method. There's nothing wrong with this. It is a simple technique that gets good results, and that's what it was intended to do. I too began on this method, see here. But I believe that we should look for more advanced methods if we wish to become better painters. At the end of the day, the Games Workshop Heavy Metal Method is one that is designed mostly for box arts and to show off every single detail on a figure, rather than present a artistically interesting thing for people to look at. It's a commercialized painting method that gets people into painting and gets decent results. Nothing more or less. Within the last 10 years, we've seen an increase in the popularity of light over figures as a main stylistic element. This is a really interesting development, as before, we were very focused on technique and having very good application of paint, but now we're seeing an artistic movement towards this emphasis on lighting and volumes. I believe this is a very good element, but it is something that takes a lot of time to understand and how to apply it. Lighting is really the focus of what makes something realistic. If you look at the development of CGI, a great deal of the work that's developed in them is making sure the lighting effect is much better and more un easily understood. I mean, we look at video games now with ray tracing and such, and we see how much R&D is being put into that and how important it is because better lighting makes things more realistic. Color is certainly important, and it's definitely the more fun part of the work, and we venerate color quite a lot as artists, but color should be thought as a secondary element when it comes to the sense of verisimilitude and getting a believable figure across, because lighting is really what we believe as real. If we look at our current image right now, we're seeing that this really isn't that less realistic even though there's no color present. All the idea of light and form and recognizability is present with just pure lighting and values. This is the technical term for light and darks of an art, values. So, we should be considering valued contrast as the most important component of an interesting painting before we even begin thinking of colors. And, by extension, the light that is impacting a figure. When a figure is lacking contrast, we can point to value as being the source of this lack of contrast almost every single time. And that's because value as a contrast element is the most important thing to get down before you think about anything else. There's a lot of different ways to get contrast, but value is king. Let's consider it as ice cream, right? If you make a ice cream and use the finest vanilla, it will probably be very good, provided you also spend an equal amount of effort on the cream and sugar that goes into it. If you spend a lot of money on really high quality vanilla beans, but you don't spend a lot of money on the cream and sugar, the structural component of ice cream, doesn't really matter how good your vanilla is, it's going to be bad. It can be difficult to really see a figure for its shapes in the very beginning. It requires a different mindset, but part of the artistic mindset is to simply look at a figure and be able to understand what it is that you're looking at and how you can light it. A Space Marine is a really good example of this because a Space Marine is almost entirely composed out of very simple geometric forms. Circles, cylinders, cubic planes, and cones. When you understand how these geometric shapes look and how they interact with light, then you can abstract these complex forms into simple ones, and then lighting them becomes significantly easier. To begin really thinking of painting at a more sophisticated level, we need to begin thinking of our figures and sitting in some sort of environment. We need to think about where light is coming from, what is around there to influence the light, and that will lead to a greater sense of verisimilitude. Some questions to consider when it comes to painting your figure are where is the light coming from? Is it coming from the sun, from the side, coming from below? And what is that source? Is it something natural, something artificial? Is it bioluminescent algae, giving it a great distinct color? And how does the light feel, right? Am I trying to make a feel of awe, splendor, dread? All of these things are 
possible with pure lighting as a contributing factor. And colors don't need to play into it too much. You can think about colors after you get the light down, and it will enhance the scene or make it different. So once you have an idea of where your light is coming from, then you can start thinking about the key, or rather, the amount of values that are going to be present in your painting. A painting of a high key has a lot of light values in it, in contrast to a one of a low key. This makes them have different emotional components to them. A lighter key usually leads to a more high energy, more friendly disposition. That's why you see a lot of children's shows with a lot of bright colors. Whereas a lot of dark colors leads to more moody, more dramatic interpretations. But within your key, you also have your variance. That is to say, what is the distinctness of your lower or higher values in your scheme? A high key painting of a, a low amount of variance is going to have a predominant use of just light values, very few amounts of darker ones to make things understood. Versus something that has a lot a high variance. A high key painting, high variance, means you're using a lot of dark values too that contrast strongly with your high key values. And this can be flipped around, low key with a high variance, or low key with a low variance. Now within our field of figures, it's a little bit difficult to do paintings that have low variance, as these figures are also very small, and low variance paintings tend to make things very difficult to view, and thus they need to be reserved for more artistic pieces that are going to be seen up close, and where they're going to observe the subtle changes in values that are present. On the tabletop, or just for general viewing, it's better to have high variance paintings, as it's just going to be seen better. We don't usually think of figures of having any sort of light source impacting them, but in truth, light is always impacting the things that we see. If we couldn't have an influence of light on something, we would see nothing. We would see blackness. This. Right now, I still exist on the screen, but you cannot see me because the light is completely absent. But if light is visible and able to reflect off of objects and be bounced into your eyes, then we can see things once more. Therefore, light is always impacting what we see and is influencing the colors of objects. This is in fact much more influential to a piece and the colors than the actual color of the objects themselves, the local color. Light is also very influential on in the creation of drama as harder or softer lights will impact a scene in a different way. A hard light like a spotlight will create very dramatic shadows and very clearly delineated forms. A soft light, by comparison, is giving a more gradual change over the form, and thus is more flattering and makes figures seem to glow with the light. And a diffused light, which is similar to that of the Games Workshop style, is something that is more akin to a cloudy, overcast day or a snowy scene, where light comes from all directions, and does not create very harsh shadows. Ultimately, lighting is an extremely important idea for figure painting, and we should be considering it more often when we are thinking about how to paint our figures. Here's some ideas to consider when you're painting. Where is the light coming from? Is it coming from a natural source? An artificial source? Some bioluminescent algae? Or something else entirely? What's the feeling you want to create? Something dramatic, something bright and cheery. The lighting will impact all this, so you should consider how you want to use it to your advantage. What kind of light are you using? Are you using a natural source like the sun? Are you using a very colored source like a fluorescent tube or a fire? This will impact the scene and should be considered if you want to create the sense of verisimilitude within your pieces. For more information on the idea of light and color and how it interacts with each other, I highly recommend the work of James Gurney's Color and Light, which is an extremely useful resource when it comes to understanding light and its interaction with our world. Let's examine this mentality on a bust. Busts are good subjects for exploration of light, as they are very open to many different types of interpretation. You can play around with different ways that light can interact with a model with an airbrush pretty easily. See my video on the sketch and glaze method for a better example of what I'm trying to do here. But, finding the right kind of light that presents the model can be a bit of a challenge. 
Some models have very clear viewing points, which makes lighting them a bit easier. Sometimes though, a model has no best one point of view, in which case you'll have to make a decision with the light. In my case, I decided on a simple 3 quarters light with the sun coming on this figure, with a secondary light from a cool source coming from the side, as if this pyro were at the precipice of some sort of cave. In such cases of airbrushing a matte white ink, it's very common for paint to dry on the needle, so airbrush flow improver will help keep the paint from drying, which is very important for such light colors like white. You can also have a toothbrush on hand to clean off the paint of the tip when it jams up. From there, I find it's helpful to use a brush to add further definition to the sculpt. The airbrush is a certainly a useful tool for setting the general light and covering large areas of paint, but it lacks the opacity with ink that a brush does with paint. Hence, the brush can add useful texture and define the sculpt in a way that an airbrush simply cannot. From here, I set the colors of my lights. A key feature of the study of color and light is the impact of colored light has on our perception of the colors of objects. In actuality, however, the local color of objects, that is, the colors of the objects themselves, are not particularly important towards verisimilitude or realism. In normal painting methods, we would set local colors down first, then glaze colors over the top that moves towards the lights and shadows. But you can invert the process of underpainting of lights first, then use transparent tones on top and get a similar result. In this case, I know the light of the sun will be quite warm, and that I want a cool light coming from the side. So I set these colors first with a warm coat of Imperial Fist on one side, and some Achillean <clears throat> blue on the right with an airbrush. In this scenario, I'm trying my best to not have too much overspray on the yellow, as the sunlight would override the weaker, diffuse light of the cave, and thus not create any strange color interactions with green. Now I'm setting my local colors. I'm going for an analogous scheme here, with reds and oranges over the model, with some warm browns for the belts, and gold for metallics. In this case, however, I did make one significant mistake by not covering my flesh with some kind of transparent skin tone, and thus I had to work quite hard to set it later. A lesson for sure. Speaking of which, it's time for brushwork and a wet palette. I set my tones down and begin work on my flesh. This is deserving of a full video, but the quick skinny <laughs> on them here is to create a realistic skin, you need a variety of colors to mimic the shifting nature of a semi-transparent layer of skin draped over muscles and bones. To that end, you can create a basic Caucasian skin tone with white, yellow, red, and blue. You begin by setting a warm off-white with red and yellow, then adding in an atomically small amount of blue to give it a bit of desaturation. In this particular example, I wanted to give the paint a bit of transparency, so instead of mixing in a lot of opaque titanium white into the mix, I used some transparent zinc white for this mixture. The general practice of setting flesh is that the brightest and warmest flesh tones will be wherever the light is strongest over the figure, moving into reddish colors in the mid-tones, and finally in deeper bluish greenish tints in the shadows. This is a bit of an extreme way to paint flesh, but the result is quite believable and engaging. The use of painting with light is best exemplified with this white shirt here. White is, again, something for another video, but in essence, a white is a product of its environment. Many struggle with painting white for both its physical properties as well as the conceptual challenge of how to paint it. The latter results from isolated thinking of the subject, the white object in question isolated about any relationship to its surroundings. This lack of knowledge bites white the hardest, as it has no color of its own, with all of their surrounding lights and colors impacting it the most of all hues. To make white realistic, and that much easier to work with, it is beneficial to set strings of warm or cold grays as the base for white, then work up in values to the desired white from there. This is not only more realistic, but easier to work with. Blacks, blues, and browns have comparatively large pigments that cover a surface far better than pure white can. This will result in layers that cover in a couple of passes, rather than the several that pure white requires. To set the proper look for a densely detailed object like feathers, it is best to try abstracting them into a single entity, rather than individual pieces that all must be carefully rendered. 
The result turns into a visually demanding string mob that doesn't actually reflect the nature of what is being depicted. This single mass not only looks better, it's actually way easier to paint as well. A bit of careful highlighting of some yellowish green for the lights and some blue green for the shadows makes the feathers convincing, without drawing too much attention away from the rest of the more important areas of the sculpt. It is not too much of a problem if you run out of space on a wet palette to simply wipe away excess paint with a paper towel or two. Afterward, I find a quick wipe of alcohol works well to remove slightly dried paint from the surface. I add some gouache to the palette and refine some of my details. Here, the point of fresh paint is to give myself the opacity and brush strokes I desire in my painting. While a wet palette is certainly useful, the behavior of the paint does change as it sits and absorbs water, usually into a more glaze-like consistency. This is fine for slow, methodic work, but sometimes you need the behavior of fresh paint for what you're trying to do. Controlled texture, edge highlighting, lines, or other areas of painting that require control are what usually thicker, newer paints are good for. With the piece in good shape now, I move to paint my metal details. While I could do some non-metallic metal for this, I just don't think a pirate model will be fitting without some glittering gold bullion on them. To that end, I begin by setting my gold areas first with a mixture of gold and a deep brown tone to enhance the gold's opacity over the surface, to cool the yellow gold down with a cooler light, and to dull the shine of the finish. Metallic pigments can have some trouble with coverage, and the addition of more opaque paint helps with the painting process. It changes the shine of the gold to more of a satin finish, which will contrast with warm light areas which will have not such a treatment, and enhance the focus of the piece with the gold's luster. With a cool gold set down, I can work my lighter, warmer, shinier gold. When using metallic paint with an emphasis on light, it can be beneficial to paint them in a manner that mimics real-life metallic surfaces, growing warmer and higher in value as they react with their light source. Not only does this improve their look, it gives some amount of practice for when you want to paint a non-metallic effect, as you begin to use the metallic paint in the same logic as a non-metallic one. The final stage of the light gold is to set some highlights of a bright silver. Shiny golds will have some amount of specular highlight on them, as the glint of the light source reflects off of them. Thus, a gold surface will have a bit of bright white reflection present, represented here by this bright silver paint. I want to enhance the color of the scene a little bit more than it is now, and on to for a bit of glazing with yellow-orange azo and Payne's Gray. The yellow-orange azo enhances the feeling of the warm Caribbean sun, and the Payne's Gray is a transparent cool black that I will use to enhance both the cool light and help sculpt the shadows. Coming to the end of the painting process, I opt for some final refinement of oil paint. I spoke briefly on this in a previous video, but I will go into a little bit more detail here as to the benefits of using oil paint. The oil wash is a simple example. With a bit of white spirit and an opaque black tone, you can create washes that fall into recesses quickly and easily. White spirit does not have the same level of surface tension as water does. A simple touch will deposit spirit and paint in an instant. This makes the tiny lines of this pirate's hair very easy to bring out, as well as of finding occlusion shadows around the areas like the earrings. When used for more traditional painting, oil's strength is its blending strength and its open duration, or how long the paint remains active and manipulated. In acrylic and especially our medium, we're used to less than a single minute of work time for layers of paint. Oil, by contrast, is open for hours. When you work with oil paint, you begin to also understand the technique of wet blending, layering, and glazing at a deeper level, in part for the more ordered process demanded by oil, but also for the time that you have to take in it, as things like layering have to take place over a much longer period. After 24 hours, the quantity of oil I've applied has stabilized enough to varnish and work over. I like how the painting looked so far, but I thought it was a bit simple and not really all that engaging. The shadow side of the sculpt reminds me of the Pirates of the Caribbean movie, so I think I should be going for enhancing the painting a bit. I set down my palette and freehand some zombie looking effects to the shadows. 
I make the undead appearance come through, with adding splotches of darkness and stippling the surface of the cool areas to create the appearance of an uneven skin and decaying materials, along with painting the underlying anatomy of a gross zombie. You can see how distinct light not only helps in the practical painting process, but also in its narrative function. The use of light as both a learning tool and a creative one is a great addition to your style and perspective in artistic analysis and understanding. With this perspective, you'll begin to use lights in all sorts of arts, and see them, recognizing the intent behind them, and know how to steal them for yourself. If you liked this video, please consider liking and subscribing. You can always ask any questions you have in the comments down below. And please consider checking out my website, where you can see a portfolio of my work. And if you really, really liked my work, consider getting yourself a commission. Take care, and have a good one.